Welcome and thank you for joining our annual IFRS session. I'm delighted to introduce Mohammed Arsalan Qureshi, Senior Manager for IFRS Accounting and Reporting Advisory Services, and Mohammed Hasnain, Lead Partner for Abu Dhabi BDO Chartered Accountants and Advisors, who will be leading today's session and providing you with a recap of IFRS 16 and IFRS 9. So Arsalan managed the, the accounting and reporting advisory services in the UAE and through this service line he provides assistance to companies with implementation of new accounting standards, complex accounting issues, public and private company reporting matters and various other technical accounting focused services. Hasnain is lead partner of Assurance Services in Abu Dhabi office and focuses in the natural resources industry sector and has over 10 years of experience in audit and assurance, including years of experience in the UAE. So, I know all of our ACCA members out there are looking forward to this session. And during this session, that we're going to be looking at the recent changes and amendments around lease term IFRIC, amendments to IFRS 16 for rent concessions due to COVID-19, key considerations due to COVID-19 on impairment assessment under IFRS 9, and the impairment of right of use assets under IS, IAS 36. This, that's a mouthful, right? So without further ado, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to BDO. And I will leave it up to both of you to lead this session. I hope you all enjoy this. Please, we do welcome your feedback. I know there are so many of you registered and I know our ACCA members are really looking forward to this technical session. So thank you to BDO for um, delivering this session for our ACCA members. We really appreciate it. And without further ado, over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Fazila, for organizing uh, the session. You, welcome. welcome, everyone, uh, to the CBD session for IFRS 9 and 16 refresher. So, Fazila has already graciously introduced us, uh, so I'm going to skip ahead uh, to our agenda for today. A uh, quick overview we'll be taking you through uh, the two standards, IFRS 9, which is financial instruments, and IFRS 16, which is uh, leases. These two are very comprehensive and detailed uh, standards, so we'll be covering only the key and significant aspects of the standards, which we feel important. And we will also be taking you through the recent amendments of IFR 16 and other key considerations relating to the impairment required by IFR 9 due to COVID-19. Our session will be concluded with a short Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please uh, submit them chat box. Uh, we'll try to address as many questions as possible by the end of this session. So we'll start with IFR 16, which has become mandatorily applicable for reporting periods starting on or after 1st of January 2019. The standard has superseded IE 17, which used to require uh, two accounting models for uh, leases, depending on which classification uh, the leases fall under whether it's operating lease or finance lease. And the biggest change that IFR 16 has introduced is by bringing in the single lease accounting model, uh, which applies to all types of leases. So which this means that uh, the operating leases, which were initially uh, previously kept off balance sheet, are now required to be capitalized in the financial statements by way of recognizing a right of use asset and a lease liability. So when we apply the single lease model, there are a lot of uh, judgmental areas, including the assessment of a lease term and uh, determining the borrowing rate. We'll be touching up all these uh, significant areas in the later slides. But before we dive into the uh, requirements, uh, detailed requirements of IFR 16, there are a couple of uh, popular views which have uh, arisen due to IFR 16, um, and we will be discussing whether these are fact or fiction. So there is no, uh, it is said that there is no impact in the profit and loss for operating leases due to adoption of IFR 16. This is a very common misconception, but uh, upon adoption of IFR 16, all operating leases especially are being capitalized in the financial uh, statements, which means that there will be a higher finance cost on these liability in the first few years. And this will definitely have an impact on the profit and loss statement. The second one is that lease contracts can be exempted if the lease term is agreed at 12 months or 11 months and 29 days. 
Again, this is definitely not a certainty because assessing a lease term requires significant judgment to be exercised by the lessee, which we will be discussing in the later slides. The third one is that the risk-free weight or company's weighted average cost of capital can be used as an incremental borrowing rate. That's uh, not entirely true because uh, these rates uh, do not reflect the uh, key characteristics that are defined for an incremental borrowing rate. The fourth one is a parent company's IBR can be used as an IBR for the company's leases. Again, uh, it's not entirely true because uh, the company's IBR should be representative of the company's own credit risk rather than that of its parent company. And uh, definitely certain adjustments will be required in order to customize it. The last one is a group of leases can be aggregated as a single lease for lease accounting under IFRS 16. Now that's uh, definitely a fact as long as the aggregation of lease accounting does not result in significantly different results as compared to accounting for lease contracts on a standalone basis. The lease contracts should have similar characteristics uh, if they are being aggregated. Ah, sorry, so uh, moving on. Uh, IFR 16 has also introduced uh, two exemptions uh, whereby the lessee does not have to apply a single uh, lease accounting model and it can continue to recognize expense on a periodic basis as and when they are incurred. So the first exemption is the leases of low value assets where basically uh, which can be applied on a lease by lease basis. And a few examples of low value assets would be office printers, uh, laptops, uh, coffee machines, and other small office items. The other lease exemption uh, is uh, basically where the short term leases are, uh, where the leases are classified as short term leases, meaning uh, the lease term is assessed to be 12 months or less. Unless there is a purchase option also embedded in the lease contract for the lessee, in which case this practical exemption will not be applicable. If a short-term leases exemption is being applied, it must be applied for all leases within the same class of underlying assets. But determining a lease term uh, to assess whether it is a short-term lease or not, it's a judgmental area. Again, it requires significant uh, assessment to be performed, which we will be discussing now in the later slide. So when you're determining the lease term, you have to consider two types of periods. The first one is a non-cancellable period, including the rent-free periods as well. And during this period, neither uh, parties, nor the, uh, neither the lesser nor lessee can terminate uh, the uh, lease uh, on a contractual basis. The second period that has to be considered is the period where the lease is expected to remain enforceable. After the non-cancellable period, the uh, parties have an option to either renew or terminate the agreement. The options may only lie with the lesser, in which case uh, this option should be disregarded and the period should be considered as part of the overall lease term. The other two scenarios is where the option to renew or extend lies only with the lessee, or it lies with both parties where they have to mutually agree on whether to renew or terminate. In such a case, the lessee has to uh, assess whether it is reasonably certain to exercise its option and renew the agreement. Now, IFR, uh, this basically, IFR 16 provides further guidance that the lessee basically has to assess whether it can terminate the lease contract without incurring significant penalty. The standard does not define what exactly constitutes a penalty to be significant, but it does emphasize on the fact that the lessee has to assess the broader economics of the contract, uh, when, uh, um, which go beyond the contractual penalties at the time of termination. This has been further clarified and confirmed by IFRS Interpretation Committee who released the final agenda on the assessment of lease term on 26th of November 2019. Now this is effective immediately and the final agenda has also emphasized on the guidance to consider broader economics of the contract and these are the indicators, uh, some of the indicators that should be considered when the lessee is performing such an assessment. For example, there is a lease contract uh, for a retail store that has a period of 12 months contractually agreed by the parties. And at the end of 12 months, both parties agree to mutually uh, decide whether to renew or terminate the contract. So the non-cancellable period here is 12 months, but the lessee also has to assess whether it is reasonably certain to renew the contract for additional years. Now, continuing with the same example, if the lease uh, lessee has also incurred significant investment in leasehold improvements, and uh, which are non-transferable, uh, 
and it has estimated that the useful life of these leasehold improvements is uh, four years. So it is clear that the lessee is likely to uh, renew the contract for another four years. Otherwise, it risks the lose, uh, lose, abandoning the leasehold improvements and incurring the additional cost. Basically, its estimate of useful life will be incorrect. So similarly, other uh, factors can also be considered, uh, which could incentivize the lessee to renew the contract, like the cost of finding a new replacement for the asset or the cost of operational disruption if that leased asset is vital for the business functionality. So all these factors need to be properly considered when performing this assessment. And this is an ongoing assessment, which has to be performed at the end of each reporting period. So once the lease assessment is uh, determined, the other area that requires significant estimation is basically determining the incremental borrowing rate. Now, if a lease contract has an interest rate implicit in the lease, then uh, and it is readily determinable by the lessee, then we are good to go. No judgment is required and we can continue uh, calculating the lease liability without applying any judgment. But that is generally not the case, and the lease contracts uh, do not usually have such interest rates uh, which are readily determinable or implicit in the lease. In that case, we have to estimate uh, the rental borrowing rate. And IFR 16 defines this rate as an interest rate which is specific to the credit risk of the lessee. It is specific to the lease term and uh, the timing of cash flows, uh, the nature of the underlying asset and its value as well as the country in which the lease has been incorporated. That is the economic uh, environment. So the bottom line is using a risk-free rate or rated average cost of capital will not suffice since these do not meet the requirements of an incremental borrowing rate. However, you can use a base, uh, you can use a risk-free rate as a base rate uh, and which requires certain adjustments in order to build up to the incremental borrowing rate that is customized for the lease contract. So once you have identified all the leases that do, uh, on which the exemptions uh, do not apply, and once you have assessed the lease term as discussed uh, earlier, and once you have estimated the incremental borrowing rate, this is how the single lease accounting model looks like. You have to consider all these payments or contractual payments within the lease contract and discount them using the incremental borrowing rate estimated at the date of the commencement of the lease in order to work out the lease liability. Once you have worked out the lease liability, you have to work your way up to uh, and add any directly attributable cost related to the lease contract in order to arrive at the right of use asset. The uh, same principles of IA 16 apply here when you're recognizing the property plan and equipment, and you have to consider all the directly attributable costs in order to, uh, that should be capitalized on the asset. Once the right of use asset is initially recognized, uh, it needs to be uh, tested for impairment under the principles of IS 36. These same principles apply for other non-financial assets as well, uh, and uh, those rules have not changed due to the adoption of IFR 16. So the lessee is basically required to assess at the end of each reporting uh, period whether there are indicators of impairment, and it has to assess whether the recoverable amount of the right of use asset is lower than the carrying value of that asset. The recoverable amount is de uh, defined by IS 36 as a higher of fair value, less cost to sell or value in use. Now the same principles will apply for the right of use assets as well as it does for non other non-financial assets under IS 36, uh, including the allocation of impairment or determining of cash generating units. But these requirements of IS 36 have become particularly important uh, this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic that is surrounding the world in a cloud of uncertainty throughout this year. There have been a lot of uh, government imposed lockdowns uh, and widespread implications for various businesses in a number of sectors. So this re uh, has uh, required uh, most of the companies to reevaluate whether their underlying assets are potentially impaired in the long run. Now IS 36 requires uh, the uh, company to test uh, for impairment using the conditions, based on the conditions that existed at the uh, reporting date. This means that for financial statements, which are ending on 31st of December, 2019, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to be a non-adjusting event. But for financial statements, uh, which are ending on 31st of March, 2020, uh, 
COVID-19 and the circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic are required to be accounted, uh, taken into consideration when calculating value and use calculations. This means that uh, it is likely to result in a revised uh, cash flow uh, for the forecast or adjusted uh, discount rate uh, to factor in the increased risk. This could mean that the company uh, that typically used to apply a single best estimate uh, when calculating uh, value and use will have to consider multiple forecast scenarios in order to address the increased uncertainty due to these unprecedented circumstances. It also means that the companies are likely to be required to consider the uh, down, uh, severe downside effects in addition to the uh, worst case and uh, best case scenarios so that they can address the long-term effects of COVID-19, which are uh, virtually uncertain at the time, at the moment. Aside from testing for the impairment, uh, the lease contracts are likely to undergo uh, changes, which may result in uh, the changes to their existing terms and conditions, such as the uh, changes to contractual cash flows, uh, the scope of the lease, a reassessment of the lease terms, as we discussed in the earlier slides. So this slide basically shows us the accounting requirements for each type of uh, lease modifications that may occur uh, subsequently. The first one is the lease modification that results in the decrease of scope. For this kind of modification, uh, there are two steps required to be followed in order to account for this uh, modification. The first step is to decrease both the right of use asset and lease liability by uh, to the extent of uh, the relative decrease in the scope. Uh, and the resulting gain or loss will be taken to the profit and loss. The second step is to remeasure the lease liability using the uh, revised uh, incremental borrowing rate at the date of modification. And the offset of the reduction in lease liability will be going to the right of use asset. Now this, is, uh, this modification uh, and its accounting is further explained by this example, where the lessee has a 10 year lease for 5,000 square meters of office space, and the annual payments are 50,000 uh, per year. The IBR estimated at the date of commencement is 6%, but at the beginning of year six, both parties agreed to reduce the scope of the lease to 2,500 square meters, which is 50% reduction. And they also reduced the contractual payments to 30,000 a year. Now, at the date of this modification, at the beginning of year six, the estimated IBR is 5%. So we have to apply the same uh, two steps. The first step is to uh, reduce the uh, lease liability, which was outstanding at the date of modification at uh, approximately 210,000, and the right of use asset, which was outstanding at 184,000. We have to reduce both these balances by 50%, which is the reduction in the scope and the remaining balance will go to the profit and loss as a gain. Once you have passed these entries, the second step is to revise the, uh, recalculate the revised uh, lease liability for the remaining five years using the uh, revised contractual cash flows and the revised incremental borrowing rate to arrive at a balance of 129,000 approximately uh, for, uh, as a revised lease liability. Now, once we have passed these entries, we have to bring the lease liability to this amount, and therefore we have to pass an adjustment uh, of 24,000 dirhams to increase the lease liability, and the same increase is also adjusted into the right of use asset. So that is how you account for the decrease in scope. For any other lease modifications, aside from the decrease in scope or the reassessment of lease terms, we have to apply only the second step, uh, which I explained in my example, that is to remeasure the lease liability using the revised contractual cash flows and uh, after re-estimating the incremental borrowing rate. The offset of this reduction in lease liability will go to the right of use asset uh, with no impact in profit and loss. Other than these lease modifications, if there is a change in the estimate of residual guarantee or index or rate uh, that is affecting the contractual payments, for this kind of modification, we have to again remeasure the lease liability reflecting the revised estimate of cash flows, but we don't have to re-estimate the incremental borrowing rate. So we can use the similar original uh, IBR to uh, uh, calculate the revised lease liability and take the offset of reduction in lease liability to provide a few assets, again with no impact in the profit and loss. So you can see the lease uh, accounting uh, requirements are quite complex. They are not straightforward. 
And these kind of changes are happening a lot uh, these days in the lease contracts due to the results of COVID-19. Many uh, form of rent concessions and reliefs are being offered by lessors to uh, mitigate the losses that lessees are incurring uh, because of the government imposed lockdowns and restriction movements. So imagine a lessee that is holding uh, a number of lease contracts uh, where rent concessions are being obtained. Applying these modification requirements can become a nightmare. So in order to address this issue, ISP has issued IFR 6, uh, amendments to IFR 16, which were released on uh, 28th of May, 2020, and they became effective immediately. The amendments uh, provide a practical expedient whereby the lessee is exempt from assessing whether a rent concession is uh, a lease modification and continue to apply IFR 16 without the lease modification requirements. This practical expedient is uh, an accounting policy choice but must be applied to all these contracts with similar characteristics if availed by the lessee. The practical expedient is available only for the lessee and there's been no amendments issued for the lesser accounting requirements as they are already pretty straightforward. Now this flowchart summarizes all the criteria that must all be met uh, in order for a lessee to, uh, to be able to apply the practical expedient. If any one criteria is not met, then the lessee is required to assess whether the rent concession is a, uh, a lease modification or not. So the first criterion requires that the rent concession must occur as a direct consequence of COVID-19 pandemic. The amendments uh, do not provide further guidance on how to evaluate this criterion. The companies will have to uh, exercise judgment when determining whether the rent concessions are directly related to COVID-19 and are not related to any other market or economic factors. The second criterion requires that the rent concession must result in the revised consideration that is substantially the same or less than the original consideration agreed to the lease contract. Now, additional judgment may be required if uh, the, um, if the uh, rent concession results in an increase in the nominal cash flows of the lease. For example, where both parties have agreed to defer uh, the payment for the next three months, which was amounting to, uh, let's say, 100 dirhams per month. And they also agreed to uh, increase the cash flows for these deferred payments to 105 dirhams per month in order to compensate the lesser for the time value of money. Now, in such a case, judgment can be applied and this criterion will be met where the time value of money can issue in a uh, jurisdictions with significant inflation rate. But if uh, the, uh, but if the uh, uh, increased cash flow also includes any kind of penalties for the deferred payments, then this criterion will not be met. Now the third criterion requires that the rent concession must cover the payments, uh, must only cover the payments during the period till 30th June, 2021. This criterion is written as a strict rule and if the rent concession covers the payment, uh, covers the payments beyond this date, then this criterion uh, will not be uh, met and the practical expedient will not be allowed. The cri fourth criterion requires that the rent concession must not include any other substantive changes in the uh, terms and conditions of the lease contract, other than the changes that are permitted by the remaining three, uh, other three criteria of the practical expedient. The purpose of this criterion is to ensure that only the rent concessions directly related to COVID-19 qualify for the practical expedient and no other modifications are covered under the scope, which may also be negotiated around the same time. Now, if all these criteria are met, the lessee is eligible to apply the practical expedient to rent concession. And this uh, practical expedient must be applied to all these uh, consistently with, uh, that have the similar characteristic. So the lessee cannot pick and choose. Now this slide shows uh, a comparison between uh, the application of practical expedient and as compared to the application of uh, the original accounting. Say that a rent concession has resulted in a reduction of uh, total lease payments. If the lessee decides to apply the uh, original lease accounting modification, then uh, the lease liability will have to be reduced in order to uh, reflect the revised consideration. But the entity will also be required to re-estimate its incremental borrowing rate. 
This requires significant estimation as discussed earlier uh, in order to uh, work out the incremental borrowing rate. And uh, the offset of reduction, uh, reducing the lease liability will go to the right of use asset with no impact in the profit and loss statement initially. However, this modification will result in the uh, revised depreciation uh, calculated on right of use asset and the finance cost on lease liability going forward. However, contrary to, the, uh, to this, if uh, the lessee has the practical expedient available meeting all the criteria and it elects to apply the practical expedient, then it will still have to uh, calculate the uh, revised lease liability that reflects the revised consideration, but the entity will not have to uh, re-estimate its discount rate, which simplifies the calculation. The offset of uh, reducing the lease liability will not go to the right of lease asset this time, but instead it will go to the profit and loss statement uh, as a gain or loss, uh, mostly as a gain if the lease liability is being reduced. So this uh, PNL impact uh, due to the rent concession, uh, re uh, due to the re reduction in uh, rent, is basically uh, the significant, the most significant uh, difference as compared to the uh, lease modification requirements. So let's uh, work through the uh, some simple examples to see uh, to demonstrate uh, the application of this practical expedient. In this example, on 1st of July 2020, the lesser agrees to defer unpaid rent for the uh, three months, April, May, and June, which will be amortized uh, on a one twelfth uh, per month basis or till, uh, from July 2020 to June 2021. So the uh, three months rent will be spread over the remaining 12 months till June 2021. So this means that the undiscounted consideration remains the same. The overall payments remain the same. It's only the timing of payment that is being adjusted. Now, assuming that all the criteria of practical expedient are satisfied, the lessee will have to recalculate its lease liability since the timing of payment is being adjusted, but it will have to calculate the lease liability using the original discount rate without re-estimating it. Once the lease liability uh, is identified, uh, this new lease liability will be lower than the original lease liability since uh, the payments have been deferred. So the longer the deferral is, the more uh, lower the lease liability will be. So the lease li uh, adjusting entry will be passed on 1st of July 2020 because on this date, the change has become effective and the lessee is able to take advantage of this rent concession. So the lease liability will be reduced by the uh, differential amount and again will go to the profit and loss statement. Another example is where on 1st of July 2020, the lesser agrees to reduce the rent for July till December 2020 by 25%. And this reduction is has been agreed uh, on unconditional basis. So that means no further conditions in the future have to be satisfied for the lessee in order to uh, take advantage of this reduction. Now, assuming again, all the four criteria of practical expedience are satisfied, the lessee determines the present value of the uh, lease liability using the reduced contractual cash flows and applying the original uh, incremental borrowing rate. This new lease liability will obviously be lower than the original lease liability since the uh, contractual cash flows have been reduced. And again, the uh, adjusting entry will be passed on 1st of July 2020 because the rent concession has been provided unconditionally. And from this date onwards, the lessee can take advantage of this rent concession. So the lease liability will be reduced by the differential amount and the credit will be going as a gain to profit and loss statement. So this covers our uh, session on IFRS 16. I'll be handing over to uh, Hasnan who will be taking you through IFRS 9 financial instruments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hasnan. Moving on to IFRS 9. Hasnan. You can uh, share your screen with Right. So the screen is working. Arslan? Sorry? Yeah. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. All right. Great. Okay. All right. All right. 
moving on to IFRS 9. <clears throat> so basically, IFRS 9 was in, uh, was effective for annual periods beginning 1st January 2018. And uh, uh, most of the uh, most of the entities have already applied the financial instruments within their financial statements. Unlike IFRS 15, IFRS 9 has not converged with the US CAP. So IFRS 9 is only within the, the application of IFRS 9 is within the IFRS only. Right. IFRS 9 basically uh, starts with three phases. The phase one is all about classification and measure. Phase two is about environmental financial assets. Phase three is about the hedge accounting. We are not going to talk about the hedge accounting today. We are going to cover the key concepts within the classification and measurement and the environment of financial assets, and then particularly discussing the aspects of these two concepts with respect to the COVID-19. So when we look at the IFRS 9 classification and measurement of financial assets in comparison with IS-39, there were four categories of financial assets within IS-39. The fair value through profit and loss, held to maturity, loans and receivables, and available. For sale. Available for sale was a residual category within IS 39, wherein in the new standard, all these four categories have been merged into three categories. Uh, the first one is amortized cost, the second is fair value through profit and loss, and third one is fair value through other comprehensive income. Unlike IS 39, the residual category within IFRS 9 is fair value through profit and loss account. So if any instrument which is not being classified, in the first three categories within IS39, it, it was usually classified under available for sale category. However, this has been completely changed within IFRS9, wherein the, where the instrument is not being categorized at amortized cost or fair value through OCI, the residual category is fair value through profit and loss account. Now, this concept is associated with key challenges, which I'm going to cover uh, shortly in my next presentation. Uh, we'll talk about it later. The second concept of uh, uh, impairment, which is completely changed in IFRS 9, is, for, is, is the change from an incurred loss model to expected credit loss model. Within IS 39, the concept was when the loss event or a default event has happened, entities used to record provision within the financial statements. But that is not the case in IFRS 9. IFRS requires entities to estimate their expected credit losses that are going to happen in future based on the information available at the balance sheet date and then at the reporting date a provision is required to be recognized within the financial statement now when we move into classification and measurement of non-equity financial assets there are two steps which any entity has to follow first it needs to understand that what business model is being used to manage a group of financial assets Secondly, what is the contractual cash flow characteristics of any financial asset? So when we talk about the business model, there are three models, uh, which uh, there are two models, basically, primarily, we have to, one is hold to collect model. Hold to collect model is something where a financial asset is being held to realize its cash flow up till its maturity. And hold to collect sell model is something when a financial asset is being held to realize its cash flow up to maturity, and the entities are also uh, allowed to sell the financial assets. The key difference between hold to collect and hold to collect and send model is that the frequency of selling of a financial asset is much more into hold to collect and sell. Hold to collect model uh, does not mean that the entities always have to hold the financial instruments till its maturity, depending on the various requirements, for example, liquid, to manage the working capital liquidity requirements, the entities are still allowed to sell the financial assets, but that should be very exceptional and infrequent basis. So in any, and if the if the financial business model is not hold to collect and hold to sell, it is classified by IFRS 9 as other model. Now the second uh, uh, criteria which we need to see is the contractual cash flow. Contractual cash flows are mainly two type of contractual, uh, contractual cash flows we need to see. One is solely payments of principal and interest. So if the financial assets results in cash flow that are solely principal and interest, this is called SPPI test. So SPPI test will be met. And if the financial asset is giving return other than principal and interest, it goes into other category. Now, if SPPI test is being met, financial asset and whole business model is hold to collect, financial asset will be categorized under amortized cost. 
if the SPPI test is met and the business model is whole to collect and sell, financial asset will be recorded under fair value through other comprehensive income. If the SPP test is not met, then the only category that is left is fair value through profit and loss. So all financial assets will go under fair value through profit and loss account. Uh, the, the key difference with IS-39 is that uh, the, the available for sale financial assets, which were previously under the OCI, there are changes into that, which we are going to cover in the next slide. Uh, the SPPI, so this is a further description on SPPI, which talks about the solely principal and payment uh, interest is the initial recognition of the financial instrument plus the interest, which, which compenses the time value of money and credit risk. All right. So uh, now there is a key requirement for all uh, equity investments. So this model, this, this model needs to be applied on non-equity financial assets. On the equity financial assets, there is a, a key change from the uh, from IS39 is the investments in share in listed and unlisted company. So previously, when the company has investment unlisted share available for sale, financial instrument uh, was allowing the company to. Uh, use that category and the financial and the investment was classified at cost but this has been changed in IFRS 9 now uh, for all the listed and unlisted uh, investments in companies should be classified at fair value so there is no option available to record the investments at cost so even if the company has investment in land list shares it has to record the investment at fair value However, for equity instruments, IFRS 9 has also given an irrevocable election to entities at the initial recognition wherein all fair value investments can be recognized in other comprehensive income and there will be no recognition of impairment loss through profit and loss account. Also, unlike uh, IS 39, on the disposal of the instrument, all OCI reserve were used to classify in profit and loss account. That option is no more available. So it will be a direct reclassification to retained earnings. Dividends will still be recognized in the uh, profit and loss account. So this was about. Uh, so this was the initial classification of a financial instrument. When we look at the measurement of a financial instrument, subsequent measurement, all amortized cost financial instruments will be initially record. The carrying value of those instruments will usually be their initial carrying amount plus interest, which is being recorded through effective interest rate method. Any receipts from the instrument less expected credit losses. For fair value through profit and loss account uh, category, financial all financial assets will be recorded at their fair value on the balance sheet date. Any change in the fair value will go to profit and loss account. Fair value through OCI instrument, again, initial carrying amount, because this is fair value to OCI instrument, and it does allow some debt instruments to record at fair value through OCI. So initial carrying value plus interest at effective interest rate method will be recognized, and fair value changes will also be recognized to reflect the carrying value. However, any expected credit losses on the fair value through OCI instruments will not be reduced from the carrying value of the instrument uh, on the balance sheet. Rather, it would be shown as an equity reserve under OCI. So these were the main changes from classification and measurement perspective. Now let's look at the, the changes with respect to the impairment model. So IS39 was uh, was requiring entities to record impairment losses based on incurred loss model. So whenever borrower has defaulted or experienced or faced experience in financial difficulties that has been restructured or there has been a payment in delay, entities used to record the provision in the financial statements. And no general provision was required in advance of a trigger event. So always a trigger, the, the event has to have happened for entities to record impairment. But this has been completely changed under IFRS 9. So uh, for IFRS 9, in order to record provision, and even does not need to trigger necessarily, entities need to estimate the expected credit losses based on the information available on, uh, on the reporting date, and then estimate what, uh, what uh, the amount of loss is likely to happen on any financial instrument and provision will be recorded. Since it requires an expectation of the credit losses over the life of instrument, naturally there is an increased level of judgment. The model is more responsive to the changes in the credit risk of the instruments and the entities has to use a broader range of information to estimate the uh, expected credit losses. 
Now, this broader range of information would be based on the historical patterns of receivables or assets, the current information that is available with the entity, and also they have to use the forward-looking information to adjust the uh, uh, their model. And that should be reasonable and supportable. The information should be available with the entity based on reasonable and it should be reasonable and supportable without undue costs and efforts. So it's very subjective concept in terms of expected credit losses. Now let's look at how this expected credit loss model is going to work. There are two approaches for any expected credit loss. So one is the general approach, which is usually followed, which is usually followed by all entities except trade receivables and contract assets. We, we are going to discuss this in the next slide. But what is general approach? So general approach has uh, has explained, has uh, categorized that any financial assets need to be categorized into three stages. Stage one, when the credit risk of the financial asset has significantly increased since its initial, has not significantly increased since its initial recognition. So it means that credit risk has not increased, the, the asset is under stage one. Where the credit risk has increased significantly since initial recognition, the instrument will move to stage two. And when the instrument has been credit impaired, it will move to stage three. Basically, stage three is the same uh, same model which IS39 loss trigger events uh, were there. So uh, when uh, when the loss trigger event has happened, IS39 used to be reported. In the stage three, if the instrument is credit impaired, then expected credit losses will be recorded completely differently. Now let's look at this matrix. How this is going to work. So let's assume if the instrument is in stage three, where is there, where is the significant, there is no significant increase in the credit risk. Instrument is in stage three. Entities are required to record 12 month expected credit losses. 12 month expected credit losses is a portion of the lifetime expected credit losses, which the entity is likely to incur in the next 12 months. Because instrument in stage three. When the expect when the when the credit risk has significantly increased, the the instrument will move into stage two, and lifetime expected credit losses are required to be recognized. And when the instrument has actually credit impaired, then it's a stage three, and again lifetime expected credit losses will be recognized. Now, what is the difference between stage two and stage three in terms of recognition of an impairment? There is no difference. It will be lifetime expected credit losses. However, the recognition of interest would differ. In stage one and stage two, effective interest rates are being recognized based on the gross carrying amount of assets before deducting any expected credit losses. But within stage three, effective interest rates are applied on a net carrying amount of assets after deduction of the expected credit losses. Right. So what so standard talks about significant increase in credit risk. What is significant in, uh, increase in credit risk? Assessments are required at the each reporting date by comparison at the position uh, at the initial recognition. So and entities are required to uh, compare the significant increase in credit risk at the reporting date with the credit risk at the initial recognition to see if the credit risk has significantly increased. Yeah. So. Uh, and the other step is if the instrument has moved from stage one to stage two, then ECL, expected credit loss measurement, will also move from 12 month to a lifetime basis. Now, standard does not provide any particular method of determining the significant increase in credit risk. Standard provides guidance and relevant indicators, and a lot of judgment is required to be applied by the entity to see and categorize how the uh, increase in credit risk has been. And also, IFRS 9 requires entity to disclose the methods used to determine the significant increase in credit risk in its financial statements. So that is the general approach about recording the expected credit losses within the financial statements. However, uh, recognizing the complexities associated with a general approach, IFRS 9 has given entities uh, some question wherein the expected credit losses on the trade receivable and contract assets, which does not contain a significant financing component, can be applied to using the simplified approach. Now, what is simplified approach? In a simplified approach, entities are not required to assess the significant increase in credit risk 
only lifetime expected credit losses are required to be recognized in the well at the reporting date in the financial statements entity usually use a provision matrix concept to estimate the expected credit losses in a simplified approach and forward looking impact forward looking information is still applied to adjust the provision matrix for the trade receivables and contract assets that contain a significant financing component and that contain uh, and lease receivables also now there is an option available to entities to record the to either use the simplified approach or they can use the general approach it's an accounting policy choice that has been given to the entities now let's look at certain misconceptions that are associated with ifrs 9 and see whether they uh, whether they are correct or not so there is a general perception that all contract assets are financial assets under ifrs 15 this is not a fact because contract assets are being recognized under ifrs uh, uh, under uh, revenue standard and ifrs 9 only talks about the impairments of the contract assets so contract assets are not financial assets Trade receivables are always kept classified at amortized cost. Again, this is a fiction because the entities need to assess their business model. If the business model is hold to collect and sell and SPPI test is being met, then ideally these trade receivables would be classified under fair value through OCI. Now, this is, this is a very common one. No expected credit losses is required at the reporting date if 95% of the trade receivables are collected subsequently. So usually what uh, entities try to see, they see the subsequent position of the recovery of the receivable and based on a handsome recovery, uh, they, record, they, they, they usually conclude that there is no provision required. That is not correct. At the reporting date, based on historical information and forward-looking uh, forward information, entities need, still need to estimate their expected credit losses on trade receivable, even if the major amount of receivables have been subsequently cleared. A best estimate can be considered when incorporating forward-looking information for ECL provision. That is also not correct. A reasonable estimate is required. So these were the key concept of IFRS 9 in terms of classification and measurement. Then now let's see how COVID-19 is going to impact IFRS 9. So on 31st December period and IFRS 9 uh, for most of the entities, it's a known adjusting event and entities are mostly required to disclose the impact of COVID-19 in their financial statements. On 30th January, financial effects of outbreak begin to become widespread. Uh, by, the, by the March, significant financial effects started to emerge, for example, closure in business, disruption in business operations, these kind of uh, effects. And by 31st of March period and onwards, effect of the outbreak will generally have an impact to most entities. So for 31st, December 2019, it's a non-adjusting event, but for all financial statements and 31st March 2020, the impact of COVID-19 will be an adjusting event within the financial statements that require an adjustment. What are mainly common scenarios that are going to be impacted is that impairment of financial assets will increase, financial guarantees issued needs to be reevaluated. there may be a modification on financial liabilities such as bank loans, and there may be a modification of financial liabilities because of the change in the payment plan and the fair value of the financial assets are likely to decline. So all these uh, impacts of COVID-19 will be adjusted in the financial segments of March reporting period. Now, again, uh, as I mentioned, the use of hindsight is not permitted when applying the IFRS 9 concept. Entities need to assess whether the information that is available subsequently was actually providing evidence of conditions that were existed at the balance sheet date, and then they need to estimate the impact. Uh, merely looking at the subsequent position, how actual events have happened and adjust the financial statements is not permitted within IFRS 9. When we talk about the stage model, how IFR, uh, COVID-19 is going to impact, that there may be a possibility many instruments from the stage one are likely to be classified into stage two and three, and hence probability of default instead of 12 month credit losses, lifetime expected credit losses are required to be recognized. When we talk about IFRS uh, COVID-19 impact on a simplified approach, so usually whenever expected credit losses, uh, this is a provision matrix which uh, usually we use to record the losses like probability of default is determined this probability of default is multiplied with exposure at default and loss given 
and the resultant amount is expected carry losses which is discounted for the time value of money based on when default event occur so because of i covid 19 what will happen many uncertainties will rise and multiple scenarios have to be considered have to be covered to see the impact of covid uh, again few key aspects lifetime credit losses because of covid 19 will go up time value of money discounting factors will result in more ecl provisions value of collaterals will go down historical information is not the only aspect to cover now forward looking factor adjustments will actually come and the system capabilities also need to be determined when we look at the implication of covid 19 from trade receivable perspective in a simplified approach here because of the covid 19 the nature of the entity's customer might change so for example if the entity has customer in two different countries that are affected by covid 19 in different situations then the entities need to regroup or segmentation of receivables will be changed and accordingly the credit loss impairment provision will uh, change so we have issued a lot of publications video has issued a lot of publications which is available on the website you guys can uh, go to the website and uh, review all those publications which are uh, written within practical examples also to discuss the impact on uh, COVID-19 on the financial segments. So this is this is all about the uh, key changes of IFRS 9 and the implication of COVID-19. I will now hand over to Arslan to see if we can uh, look after a few questions and answers that has been raised by Arslan, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Asnan. Uh, all right, so we have received uh, quite a few questions, and uh, I would just uh, I'll try to address as uh, many as possible. So, uh, starting with the first question, uh, whether there is any monetary threshold for low-value items. Uh, this is regarding IFR 16, uh, the exemption that is there for the lease of low-value assets. So, uh, in the basis of conclusion for IFR 16. Uh, it has been mentioned that the threshold of around uh, $5,000 was discussed, but it was never included in the standard. So there is no threshold uh, that uh, must be applied. It's more of a, a relative measure which we have to assess based on the underlying nature of the asset and also the company's uh, usual capitalization policy that they have for uh, the recognition of assets. This is to ensure that the policies are applied on a principal basis consistently uh, across the globe and not, uh, not to be considered as a rule based the second question is what if uh, the company not following the application applications of ifr 16 on a monthly basis and they are following the old practices uh, i'm guessing is 17 they are of the view that at the end of the years the necessary adjustments will be passed for the external audit purpose that application oh, uh, for uh, if the company has one or two leases uh, to manage only, then yes, it can uh, work. But again, it's an unnecessarily time-consuming practice because you're practically following two types of accounting treatments at the same time. And if you do have a, a larger number of leases, then that is definitely not recommended. Uh, it's uh, going to be a nightmare. All right, uh, the third question is when we need to deduct lease incentives from leased assets, rather, why we need to deduct lease incentives from leased assets rather than lease liability? Uh, I'll answer this uh, with an example. Uh, for example, uh, the, lesser, uh, the lessee has acquired the lease and uh, when you're uh, going for a real estate lease, you normally go through a real estate uh, broker. So you also have to pay a brokerage commission to the real estate agent. And this kind of commission is uh, required to be capitalized in the right of use asset since it's a directly attributable cost in order for you to procure the lease. So when you're paying the brokerage commission, you're debiting your bank or cash and you're crediting your bank or cash and you're debiting your right of use asset. But if the lesser has given you an incentive where he is reimbursing you that commission which you paid to the broker, then this incentive Will have, uh, will have to be deducted from the right of use asset where the original cost was recorded. So that is, that is, this has nothing to do with the lease liability, which purely focuses on the contractual cash flows of the lease contract. All right, the other question also regarding IFR 16 is, what will be the uh, journal entry for demolition cost, which, uh, which is mentioned in the lease contract? 
whether to uh, debit right of use asset and credit provision of assets removal, or to debit right of use asset and credit liability instead. So it will be the former entry where you debit the right of use asset and credit the provisions for asset removal because the present value of the provision, such a provision, to restore the asset will have to be uh, recognized separately in the financial statements uh, under IS38. It does not form part of the lease liability. All right, uh, another question is when we are following practical expedient of, uh, I'm assuming uh, this is uh, regarding the amendments to IFR 16 for rent concessions. Uh, you explain the impact on lease liability. What will happen to right of use asset? That is a good question, uh, actually. Uh, so what happens to uh, right of use asset is basically nothing. A right of use asset will be uh, continued to be carried at its uh, carrying value and will be tested for impairment uh, if any indicators exist at the reporting date. But under the practical expedient, no offsetting adjustment goes to right of use asset. It will go to the profit and loss uh, as a gain. All right. Uh, this one is regarding IFRS 9. Uh, it says, how do we account for interest on loan waived by the bank for the period of April COVID-19? That's a good question. So uh, COVID-19 has resulted in a lot of uh, these kind of uh, reliefs which are offered by the banks or other financial institutions. And uh, this uh, is basically a modification of financial instruments under IFRS 9. Um, so the financial liabilities will have to be uh, recalculated based on the revised contractual cash flow. So uh, the effective interest rate will have to be uh, modified and uh, I mean revised. And then uh, whatever the difference is in the new financial liability as compared to the older one, that will uh, go to the profit and loss statement as a modification. Right. Right. Another question relating to IFRS 9 is uh, if investments uh, were previously on uh, available for sale uh, under IS 39, but due to COVID-19, the client has changed the classification from available for sale to help to maturity. Uh, it hasn't adopted IFRS 9 yet. So if we apply IFRS 9 and uh, the same scenario, on the same scenario, what will be the classification? But, uh, I believe if it is uh, whether it would be fair value through profit and loss. All right. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what the underlying rationale here is for the client changing the classification to healthy maturity just because of uh, COVID-19, and also why IFRS 9 is not being followed since that's basically a non-compliance right now for IFRS. However, if uh, assuming it is an equity instrument which was being classified at a sale. It is likely to go to uh, fair value through profit and loss category under IFRS 9, but it can also be uh, designated at uh, to fair value through OCI upon uh, when transiting to IFRS 9. Now you have to uh, bear in mind this is an irrevocable designation and cannot be changed afterwards. All right. Uh, the last question uh, for IFR 16, uh, whether uh, some concessions are provided by way of converting the rental model from fixed to percentage of sales. How will that be dealt? All right. So I'm assuming that the uh, lesser has provided a rental concession in the form of which is conditional upon uh, a certain threshold of the sales being met. So this is a conditional uh, rent concession. In my example, I talked about the unconditional one where we have to revise the lease liability. So since this is dependent on a certain condition and it will be, it will have to be assessed on a month to month basis, whether the lessee is even entitled to receiving the rent concession. So uh, in this case, we don't have to remeasure uh, the lease liability as at the date uh, when this rent concession is agreed because we can't recognize the entire uh, change uh, on that day. We'll have to monitor on a month to month basis. Uh, we'll have to keep on uh, recognizing the original carrying value of the financial liability applying the amortized cost approach. And if at the end of each month, for example, by the end of July, uh, we see that the uh, sales have not been uh, meeting the required threshold. So the lessee is eligible uh, to uh, get the concession like 25% uh, reduction in the rent for July. Then at the end of July, we will pass the differential entry based on uh, what we had initially considered that the rent will be uh, required to be paid. 
and what the actual rent is being paid to the land, uh, landlord. So the 25% differential at that point in time, we will be recognizing uh, taking it out from the lease liability and uh, taking it to the profit and loss as a gain. Right. So uh, I'm sorry we can't address all the questions uh, at the moment due to time constraints. So if you have any uh, further questions, uh, just please uh, feel free to reach out to us, and we'll be happy to uh, discuss it with you as, uh, uh, on those clarifications. Thanks a lot, and thank you, Fazila, again for organizing this wonderful uh, opportunity, and Hasnan for uh, joining me uh, on this session.